like I said, you know, the font changed down the road. You know, we had this font and a little bit more here. Things loosened up a little bit because, um, see, you know, the rate, the big rating uh, probably would be four, the four penis rating, I believe. Let me, let me just double check to make sure I'm not wrong here. Uh, yeah, we have, um, I guess it's four. Yep, it's four. Four would be the big one. Now, this one has a bunch of model studios. Here, here's, here's some, you get, you get a click, click out of, kick out of this one, the Deep Purple Studio, the Elegante, the Fifth Avenue Studio, the Gemini, the House of Eros. Okay, um, most of these places were shitholes. Middle Earth Studios, Perfumed Garden Studios, the Pink Orchid, um, Studio Erotica, Sultan's Harem, and the Tender Touch. Um, the way this whole thing worked, and I do mean it was a work, pretty much there was an admission to get in, and you were picked a model, which maybe they had two or three of them. You went into a threadbare room, and then whatever you got was negotiated with the model. In other words, that admission fee, whatever it was, had nothing to do with whatever service you wanted the model to perform. That was extra, called tipping. So I found that out the hard way, but more on that later. So now the font had changed like this here. Now this one, we're in the 274, and this is 1974. So this would have been prime time for yours truly because he was out of high school and was going over there all the time. And uh, yeah, Deep Throat was the one, fi one film they got that basically had the four erect penis rating. And it was the only film they would let have that rating because when I worked for the new owners, quote unquote, I gave one film which I thought was head and shoulders above Deep Throat, Insatiable, a four erection rating, and they said, no, we can't do that. And they're not around anymore, so you wonder why. I'm not saying I know what I was doing, but I pretty much did. So, okay, we're looking for whatever here. Swingers, parlors, um, model studio. They were still model studios down then. They weren't massage parlors, but they changed names. It was the Cat House, that leaves nothing to the imagination, the Tender Touch, the Scorpio, the House of Relaxation, Cleopatra's Den, uh, Caesar's Retreat. Now, see, there was a big to-do. There was better, for lack of better words, leisure spas, but they cost a lot more money. It was 100 bucks to get in. Um, one right here is Spartacus. Um, another one is the Victorian Spa. So these places were pretty much priced out of guys like me existence. Now, now we're getting up into um, the good old days. Rudy Giuliani was big, the big one of the real big anti-porn crusaders, and him and Al locked horns all the times. And he was featured on the cover. Now I don't know if there's anything new and exciting here that I haven't spoken about already. But we will check, because I'm going to get you the full, full throttle benefit of this whole thing here, because, you know, you don't get this anymore. Um, let's see what they did here. Um, this is, now we're going in 1998, we're taking a huge jump. But um, there was a lot of stuff going on, they changed body modification. There was Asian spas, which were all run out of business. There was transvestite clubs and services. There was body rub places. Uh, swing clubs. Um, movies were basically almost gone at this point. Um, you know, it took, there was Peep Show Emporiums. We still had the Adult Entertainment Center on 8th Avenue. We still had the flagship of the porn industry, Show World Center on 8th Avenue, and that was open 24 hours. Bookstores, we still had um, 250 Book Center right in the middle of uh, 8th Avenue and 46th Street. Um, Let's see what else do we have here. Pretty much, you know, when you get into the 90s, they had pretty much wiped out a lot of stuff, but I'm going to go back to the whole massage parlor thing. Basically, I went to a place on 42nd Street, which I found through Screw, called the Dating Room. And I went up and you got, you know, had to buy a membership card. That was two bucks. Admission was 13 bucks. And I was a young kid who didn't know any better. But luckily found 
you know, it's a cliche, the hooker with the heart of gold, but she knew I was just a young douchebag who didn't know any better and basically said, well, how much can you tip? And I'm like, shit, I don't know. And she, well, how much do you need to get home? So basically, um, I got a Hummer for $8 and I promised her I'd be back because I was working for a sweater company at the time. And I said, I'd rip off a couple sweaters and give them to her. So that's what I did next time I went over there. But these girls changed houses all, all the time, you know, went from different places. Uh, going back to the covers and Mr. Giuliani, who is a scumbag. Here's another one where Al buried him here, sleeping with his cousin. Uh, his divorce, which was publicized not only in Screw, but in the Daily News, too. Um, paint, painting Giuliani out as a crook, which he was. And we go back to, you know, that font. And here's, this will be like the last, this is the way it was toward the end. We got a glossy cover, the price had increased from the 35 cent uh, original price to, what the hell did they get for this damn thing? 3.95 now, that was, this was under the new owners and the new owners quickly crapped out. Um, my thing was with Mr. Goldstein, I didn't know him personally, I ran into him at the Harmony Burlesque. Um, me and a buddy of mine, Richie, were over there watching the strip show when all of a sudden the Midnight Blue camera crew comes in. Midnight Blue was Al's cable access station. And they came in with all these cameras and spotlights and shit like that. And the rest of the patrons scurried out, like pulling their hats over their faces like this and pulling their coats over their heads. Me, like I give a shit, Richie, like he gave a shit. So. They're filming this girl doing her act. Richie's keeping up a running conversation with her. That goes on for like 20 minutes, then she's done. And we're the only two patrons in the theater. So I was like packing up and he goes, what are you two fellas doing? I just saw the show and he goes, come on over, I'll buy you a drink. So we went over to this uh, industry bar, I believe it was called Bernard's, it was close by, and uh, Al bought us a couple drinks. That was my first encounter with Al. Um, my second encounter was when I started writing, um, I was going to write for the Something Weird Video Blue Book, and they wanted me to do stuff on 42nd Street. So I got in contact with uh, Eric Danville, who was one of the editors over at Screw, and he spoke to Al, and they basically let me in the office, let me go through all the back issues, let me photocopy some stuff for the magazine, and that's how it started. Now. Over the years, I would just run into Al. Um, he was up at Chiller Theater one time because he was dating Linnea Quigley. And I guess he had come in at night, and it was a Sunday, and everything was pretty much, you know, Sunday was a slow day then. And one of the security cops, who was a real prick, goes, See that scumbag over there sitting waiting for a bus? That's that fucking Al Goldstein. I hate that son of a bitch. I'm like, Al's over there? Gotta go say hello. So I walked over, you know. Al remembered me, we were talking, he told oh, I'm here to see my girlfriend Linnea, and we spent the night, and he goes, hey, if I could ever do anything for you here, and he handed me his business card, which was cool. So, okay, that was like maybe one of the last times I had seen him, and then I had went to work for New York City Liquidators. And Al, you know, the whole deal was, I would walk, you know, from Port Authority down to, uh, 20, West 27th Street, which was about a mile stroll, which kept me in shape, and there was a newsstand kiosk, uh, kiosk on the corner, and Screw came out every Tuesday, and I religiously would buy, you know, a copy of Screw, sit in my little cubicle there, which the pictures have been on the internet a couple times of me reading the morning paper, so to speak, and uh, that was, you know, every week occurrence. So, we had um, booked a booth in this uh, place in the Javits Center. Uh, it was a sex boat thing. It was um, a celebration of all kinds of, you know, things. And Norman took a booth and we loaded up with videotapes and went in there. Um, Trauma was set up there. My buddy uh, Joe Fleischaker was running their booth. I also ran into my other buddy, a writer, Jack Ketchum, because they were on the other side of the room. The smut, the real smut was on one side, that was us, and the creative smut was on the other side. So I ran into Jack went back to his table, had a couple drinks, went back to the booth and stood on my chair and started walking videotapes. And Norman looked up and he goes, if I knew that's all it would have taken to wind you up, I would have brought a bottle over. So 
The next day, Al Goldstein was there. So uh, I roamed over with um, my buddy Alex, who was his black porn star, and I, hey, Al, how you doing? Oh, Pete, good to see you. Go, hey, my buddy Alex wants to know if he can get a picture taken with you. And Al goes, I don't take pictures with black people. That's the way he was. He was just breaking balls. So in the interim, all this stuff happened under the watchful eye of Rudy Giuliani. It just slipped by him for some reason. And when he found out about this, talk about pitching a hissy fit. He was out in front, waving his arms, had a news crew there telling everybody how this damn thing shouldn't have happened. Uh, this is a disgrace to the city, this and that and the other thing. So I'm sitting there with Al. We're watching this out the damn glass or something so he had wandered toward the front. And Al goes, I don't get this guy. He goes, I can't stand this scumbag. And he goes, there's not a damn thing sleazy about this event. And he looks at me and he goes, except me and you. I took that as a high compliment. So Al had, you know, the thing was, Al was making a shitload of money on the 800 number ads, the phone sex ads, and things like that. He was also getting in a lot of trouble because of his ex-wives and things. And they never could pin him down. He always beat him in court, but he did something foolish. He left which, which was construed as a death threat on an answering machine. That started the downhill slide. The other thing was, he was, you know, the, the bane of Giuliani's existence, but the same ads that were running in Screw were also running in the Village Voice and the New York Press. And these were free papers that you could pull out of a kiosk on every, every corner. So he was pitching a fit that he was losing advertising revenue because these were free and any kid could pick this shit up. And be honest with you, he had a fucking valid point there because any kid could pick it up. So that sort of led to like the, the loss of, of revenue and the sort of downhill slide because Al went to court. He was sort of losing it. Um, I don't know if it was, it was dementia. Or, or whatever, Bill Lustig had brought him over to a chiller theater show because he had just bought all the um, the um, Midnight Blue stuff and was going to put it out on DVD. Of course, he didn't pay a lot for it, and of course, Al went off on him after it came out because, you know, not that it made any money, because I don't think it did, but Al just felt he was screwed and basically went off on Lustig. He was sitting there and he was telling me, he goes, you know something? He goes, you want something on there quickly? I got her underwear and it's got all her DNA in it. I'm like, oh, that's just something I want to really have on my top shelf, but I never brought it up again. Um, sadly, Al went into decline, um, got sick. He wound up in the, he tried to hold a couple of jobs, but he just couldn't because he was Al. Um, Penn Gillette, I believe, was paying his rent when he found out that he was in such dire straits. They got him. They got him in a you know a rent controlled apartment just to keep him out of trouble and stuff like that. But unfortunately, um, Al had a multitude of illnesses and he was badly diabetic, and he wound up in the VA. And you know, sadly, he passed away. Um, but a lot of people talk shit about Al, and I'm not going to say I was close friends with Al because I wasn't. He was an associate, he was a good guy. If he didn't let me into that office, you know, when I was first starting out writing, you know, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. So he sort of gave me a break that way. And whenever I met him, he was always, you know, magnanimous with me, always gregarious, you know, never had a bad word to say. You know, we always shot the shit and got along. And, you know, he was truly an American icon and a voice for freedom of speech and anti-censorship and a guy that we sorely need today.